Respectfully Disagree Podcast. Back with another episode. Um, make sure I got my volume up. Um, it's been a minute. Um, just wanted to take a break. It's been a lot going on, man. Uh, some of which I don't want to share the audience at this time but um for those that are new to the channel man please feel free to uh go out and hit that subscribe button for me um, i'm currently at 705 subscribers on youtube so <laughs> definitely appreciate the, the love and support um it's been an uphill battle man in terms of the the podcast and you know trying to create content and figure out avenues to separate yourself because right now so many people are doing podcasts and in my opinion at times there's not a, a lot of originality it seems like everybody's talking about the same things uh relationships or current events politics things like that and it's just a, a hard space right now to just kind of separate yourself and and grow and find content that people actually want to listen to and find entertaining informative etc but I'm going to continue with the grind because at this point I've invested a lot of money, a lot of resources into this and, um, Hey, just keep going slow and steady wins the race. Uh, the, of course the goal has always been to try to get to a thousand because at that point, that's when you can, uh, monetize off of advertisements and things like that. I'm currently el eligible to monetize the channel but it's one of them things where it's like encouraging people to buy memberships and stickers and this and that and it's like i feel like that's more geared towards streamers people that are constantly you know online and hey send me a, a heart blah 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 you're constantly asking for people to donate to the brand to the channel and things like that and honestly i don't feel like i have the audience to do that. Um, I've tried to go live several times and, you know, of course it's the, the usual faces. So shout out to everybody that, that always tunes into the live or whatnot. But in terms of being able to just sit here and live broadcast and stream, I honestly don't feel like I have the, the, the listeners to go down that Avenue to where it's like, you know, you're constantly asking people to, you know, donate and, buy this and buy that so the goal is a thousand subscribers in that way i'll qualify for advertisements but anywho man enough rambling um like i said i i've been in a in a dark space um for quite some time now but today's topic is where do you draw the line between trusting God and allowing fear to dictate your path? I know that's a lot to unpack, and that's me kind of trying to think of it off the fly because I have no notes. It's midnight. Um, the game just went off, kids are asleep, my wife's asleep, and I just got a lot on my mind. And 
I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say and how I'm trying to word it is like I'm looking at current events. I'm looking at the hurricanes and natural disasters and things that's that's taking place across this country and I've I've got like I'm I'm torn because we have a lot of family that's in Florida. And I've seen, you know, several posts and things and people are like, We're not leaving. We're staying here. Um based on the radars, it looks like it may go north of us or whatnot. But in my mind I'm like, is that people putting their trust in God and just saying, Hey, we're we're not concerned about a hurricane. We're not going to push the panic button. Or is this a situation where other people are allowing fear to dictate how they're maneuvering? You're going to push the panic button. The highways are jam-packed. I think I've seen something earlier where a lot of the gas stations are running out of gas. So I'm just sitting there and I'm asking myself because it's like, I am so torn. And if you believe in, in, in Jesus Christ, then you're not supposed to live in fear. You're not supposed to worry. You're not supposed to stress. If you trust in the Lord, then you, you, you live by faith, not by sight. I've heard that in my, my entire life. But now I'm approaching 40 um different life obstacles and things like that and you you're looking at stuff through a different lens and I'm just I'm just torn on that so I just I wanted to turn the microphone on and just kind of vent kind of ramble for a moment because I don't know if I necessarily agree with people choosing to bunker down and ride it out. And I understand that there's been plenty of times that the meteorologists have predicted things and it didn't happen. You know, we've predicted rainstorms, snowstorms, and didn't see a single drop. So you had people, you know, going to the grocery stores, buying up things, and boom, it missed us. And not to get too biblical or whatnot, but it's like, did God not appoint <laughs> meteorologists, you know, people that enjoy studying weather and things like that, like, is that not? somebody that you would look to and be like, you know, God gave these people the ability to read, understand weather patterns and try to predict. Of course, it's all predictions, but it's like, are we, are we leaning on our own understanding or is this us saying, hey, I'm not going to live in fear? Like, I have so many questions as it pertains to that because the previous hurricane, Helene or whatever it was called, it just had me so heartbroken watching people lose everything. I cannot even imagine what that felt like or feels like because they're still going through it. That's something that you're not just going to recover from and for those that are uh, listening from Western Kentucky, when that tornado hit a few years ago, you know some people are still trying to recover from that. You 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 see the videos, you see the things that's happening, and you ask yourself, why didn't you get up and leave? Of course, nobody could predict what was going to happen that far in in terms of 
that area has never seen that type of catastrophic rain and mudslides and things like that. So why would they prepare for a hurricane all the way in Tennessee and the Carolinas and things like that? You've never really seen or heard of that before. So they were not prepared. And then a week and a half later, here comes another hurricane, and you still have people choosing to say, hey, I'm I'm going to ride it out. And I'm just like, bro, like, I don't get it. I don't get it. So for those that are listening, man, reach out to me privately if you want to. Um, shoot me a comment on the on the YouTube page and, and let me know your thoughts in terms of what should you do in that moment when they're trying to predict uh, Category 4, Category 5, um, heavy downpours, heavy, you know, flash flooding, things like that. And it's like, I can't imagine seeing my house being washed away, seeing my cars being washed away on top of the fact that I had the opportunity to leave this. But it's just, it's it's tough for me. I'm saying all of that because I want to have this big, big conversation just about trusting God, allowing God to lead your life instead of leaning on your own understanding. And I'm going to tie it back into myself because I don't know, man. I just, I, I've been in a real bad funk here of late and just kind of don't want to be bothered. Just kind of off to myself and a few people reached out just to ask, you know, are you good? You all right? Just based on some of the posts that I've been seeing. And it's crazy how sometimes social media just kind of, for whatever reason, things just come in front of your face. And it's almost like it's talking to you because of what you're going through. And I saw a post the other day and it was like, as soon as I get myself out of this hole that I put myself in, I'm 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 coming back strong or or whatever. So hold on, see if I can find it real quick. And when I see different posts like that, it's just like man, like I really really needed to hear that and see that. And um, the post said. Let's see here. Once I get out of this hole I put myself in, it's over with. And it just hit home for me because I don't know, man. My mother passed four years ago. It'll be four years in December. And you would think as time goes by, you would learn to adjust and just kind of accept things for how they are and just kind of deal with it. But I feel like it's been the complete opposite. Every year that goes past, it feels like it gets worse. And this is right around the time when her health took a turn for the worse. Her surgery was scheduled for October. And she spent Thanksgiving trying to recover in a rehab facility. And that's when her cancer came back and started spreading and was and was more aggressive. So I don't know if it's when we get to this time of the year 
weather's changing, you know, it's getting cooler. And with that comes mood changes and stuff like that. I've always heard that, you know, cold, rainy, damp weather, it changes your mood. And then, you know, on the flip side, sunny weather, you know, gives you more positive energy and things like that. So I'm like, I don't know if this is the seasonal <laughs> depression or or whatever you want to call it, but it's like for the last four years, around, right around this time is when I just kind of get in this funk. And no matter how bad I, I try to steer myself and get out of it, it's like for whatever reason I can't. And then you start realizing the toll it takes on your health, um, how it impacts the, the people around you. And I don't know, man. It just, it hasn't gotten better. And in saying all of this, I know overall it sounds like I'm all over the place, but just, just, just trust me for a moment. This is me opening myself in a manner that I, I said I would never do on a podcast, but I don't know. Maybe this will help me feel better in the end because I'm saying that I've asked my wife or I've mentioned it, and it's like, have I gotten to the point to where I, I no longer trust God? I'm leaning on my own understandings and things and going out here and maneuvering and making decisions and not even thinking about the consequences and you take things for granted and the way society is going right now, the economy, everything's so up and down and you just assume that tomorrow is promised. You just assume that everything is going to be all right and that's why seeing the hurricane and seeing all this different stuff it just got me sitting around questioning how I'm maneuvering and watching and listening other people you know when they say I'm not going nowhere and I'm like dude like are you really willing to put your life on the line simply because you feel like you have the right to do so? Is this a religious reason why you're saying, you know what, I'm I'm not panicking, I'm I'm not living in fear or things like that. And that's why I was just like, bro, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn the mic on and I'm just gonna hit record. Um in terms of me, life. <laughs> I'm now fearful because I I see signs of it impacting my children. Like I've always had a a fear of speaking in large crowds. I've always let anxiety kind of drive my decisions and things like that and kind of lived in fear. And a lot of decisions and things that I've made throughout my life, it may not necessarily be a decision that I truly wanted to make, but it was a decision that I made because I didn't want to disappoint other people. I was afraid of the outcome. And I be damned. If now my kids are doing the same thing, um, my oldest, Aubrey, she has basketball tryouts tomorrow. And all this time, deep down, I, I can sense that she really doesn't want to play basketball, but they've said to me that 
they don't want to disappoint me. And I've never said that to them. I've never said, I want you all to play basketball. No matter how much I love the sport, I will never force them to play it. Like, I want them to fall in love with it and gravitate towards it because they want to, not because they're doing it for me. And no matter how many times I tell them that, it gets to the point to where you can tell that she's putting a lot of extra pressure on herself. And I had a long talk with her tonight. It took everything in me not to break down because, you know, she cried for a little bit and she was just talking about how she's nervous and how she has a fear that she's not going to make the team. And I'm trying to tell her, I'm like, you worked this summer. You put in the work. You've been on the basketball team for the last three years. What's making you feel like you're not going to earn a spot? As long as you go out there and try your best and do everything that you can possibly do to make the team, then you just live with the results. It doesn't matter if you make it or not. And it hurts my heart to know that at 11 years old, my children have anxiety issues. And I'm like, bro, like, I honestly feel like I've passed that down to them and it's things that I, I I never talk about I just kind of bottle it all up and that's why I'm, I'm centering all of this around trusting God or letting fear drive you are you really trusting God or are you letting fear drive your decisions because she didn't make the volleyball team. Okay, I'll start there. We can go back. This summer, she tried out for volleyball. She didn't make the team. And like I told her, I said, you had all summer to get up, work out, work on different things. And if you chose not to do that, then what makes you think you're deserving of making a spot on the volleyball team? And I hate that you have to have that type of conversation with someone that young because growing up, I didn't have to do that. They just made an announcement. If you want to be on the basketball team, come to the gym after school. And it was a situation where pretty much everybody who came made the team. Grab a drink real quick. Hold on. Everybody who came to the gym made the team. So you didn't have that fear of what's going to happen if I get cut? What's going to happen if I don't make it? So from that aspect, I have no experience. I can't, I can't relate to them in that term. You know, I was fortunate to where I didn't have no fear of not making the team. I was always a starter. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was – I was talented to the point to where not making the team never crossed my mind. Not getting any playing time never crossed my mind. But now, living in a major city, when there's 40 or 50 girls trying out for a team that only maybe has, what, 12 to 14 spots, that's a lot of pressure. She made the team last year. And like I told her, I was like, the older you get, the more athletic, the more competitive, the more you're going to have to come out of your shell to compete. The older you get, this is no longer about having fun. Yes, it, let, me, let me take that back. The goal is to have fun. But when you put on a uniform, and you represent a school or anything or any team, the goal is to compete. Have fun while you're competing. And that's what I'm trying to explain to my children. It's like 
there's a difference between playing basketball and volleyball, football for fun in the backyard or at the park. There's a difference. When you step on that line, step on that court, and you have a uniform on that represents your school, you're trying to win. And she got that phone call saying that she was not selected to make the team. She was heartbroken. I was heartbroken because that's the first. That's the first experience for me and my wife in terms of having a kid that that didn't, you know, get a spot on the team or whatnot. And I tried to have that heart-to-heart with her in terms of, hey, you get out of it what you put in. And if you didn't put anything into it, you're not going to get anything out of it. So that's why you didn't make the team. So then she expressed to us, can you put me in more activities where I can get better and this and that? We said, sure, fine. Sent her to basketball camp, got her a basketball trainer. She was doing, you know, one-on-one lessons and things for the last three or four weeks. And then, boom, tomorrow's tryouts, and my child cried herself to bed because she's nervous. And I'm just like, I'm, no matter how many pep talks and things that I'm trying to instill into her and build her confidence up and tell her not to live in fear and things like that, I'm saying all the things that I'm hoping she wants to hear. But in reality, I'm like, how can I say these things when I don't even take that advice? And that's exactly why I have this this mic on tonight. I'm, I'm trying my best not to go too long. But it's like I just needed some time to just self-reflect, um, understand where life is trying to guide me where God is trying to guide me and do everything that I can to help, you know, be there and provide for my family as well as be there and and maintain for myself. Because how can I tell a child, don't live in fear, don't let anxiety drive you and force you to make decisions that you may not want to make when I'm currently suffering with that. Um, I made a video a few weeks ago announcing that I was going to accept the eighth grade varsity basketball position here at one of our uh, middle schools. And when I made the video, it was following me going and meeting with the athletic director. I pretty much was told the job is mine. All I got to do is put in an official application for uh, JCPS. And once I put in the application, they'll pull it, sign the contract. We're good to go. So at that moment in time, I was excited. Had a huge, you know what I'm saying, roller coaster ride in terms of range of emotions because originally the position was presented to me over the summer. I went and met with the athletic director, and I was told that I would be contacted. That didn't happen. So I just assumed that, hey, they moved in another direction. It just wasn't meant to be. So in terms of coaching at the middle school level, I had turned that switch off. So mentally, I wasn't even there anymore in terms of, hey, I, I want to coach at the next level. I want to do this. I want to do that. I had turned that switch off. Um, due to unfortunate circumstances, I was no longer, you know, able to coach at the elementary school level. Um, that's a whole nother situation in its own self. Um, it is what it is. So when school season started and I realized that, hey, that's off the table. I had put myself in dad mode. I'm like, I'm going to be here to support 
and help my kids in any way that I can help. Um, for the last few years, I've been coaching elementary, so I've been saying to myself, I'm like, bro, I'm sitting here spending all this time building up other people's kids when my kids need that time. Who knows where my kids would be at if I was more hands-on, one-on-one with them, helping them build their confidence and things like that. And who knows, my child wouldn't have been crying tonight about tryouts because she would have had all the confidence in the world because I would have been there every step of the way instead of being a part-time, you know, by them going to different schools when they have practice, I'm at practice. And then by the time we get out, it's dark. You know, time changes. On the weekends is usually when Peyton and them have games. So it's like you really don't have that window of opportunity to just be one-on-one with my kids to help get them up to speed in terms of being competitive and, you know, skillful. So – I'm in dad mode now. I'm like, cool, not coaching. Um, I'm going to focus on my kids. School year, you know, a couple weeks in. Hey, we still need a coach over here for middle school if you're interested. Now, mind you, I'm I'm being 100% honest. I had already made up in my mind that I didn't want to do it. But I kind of felt like I was being boxed into a corner in a sense. It just kept coming up, kept coming up. And, you know, people's like, oh, you know, the kids are excited. They want you to coach, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, you know what, F it. So I go and meet with the athletic director a second time. And this is when I was told, hey, put in the application, blah, 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 blah. So I submit the application that same night reach out to the athletic director. I'm like, hey, submitted the application. Uh, My background check and stuff is still on file from when I was coaching elementary, so everything on my end is good to go. Never heard anything back. Didn't even get an acknowledgement that my message was received. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? I'm saying all of this because it kept me up at night. I could not eat. I could not sleep. I was just so nervous and I was so anxious and worried. And, you know, people was like, you know, we're we're excited to have you. We got some transfers in. Uh, we got a kid that transferred over. Um, he's 6'3", averaged almost 20 points last year. We got another kid that came in. He's 6'1". He averaged over 15 points. We're going to have a great team. We're looking to try to win a champion. Like, they're saying all these things, and I'm trying to process it all in my head. This is my first time coaching at this level. Um, The difference between elementary school and middle school is you can full court press now. Like, I'm sitting here and painting all these different scenarios in my head. What if I mess up? This is eighth grade varsity. What if I ruin these kids' opportunity to go play high school ball? Like, endless nights. Could not eat. Could not sleep. The thought of basketball would make my stomach hurt. I have a book. I'm drawing out plays. I wrote out how my practices were going to go. I wrote out how conditioning was going to go. I have all this stuff. And I'm asking myself, am I prepared? Am I prepared? And I'm overthinking everything and still never heard nothing from the guy. A few weeks went by. Finally, I get news that some personal situations occurred and the athletic director was forced to step down. So that's what the dilemma and the delay was. A lot of things had occurred and you know, due to unfortunate situations, athletic director was forced to step down. The new athletic director contacted me. I spoke with her over the phone for a good 30, 40 minutes. And she's like, 
Are you CPR certified? Oh, <laughs> what? No, I'm I'm not. Um, well, have you taken the courses that coaches are required to take? I have no idea what you're talking about. Such and such didn't tell you about this. No, ma'am. This is my first time hearing it. So here goes the anxiety again. I'm like, dude, I'm not prepared. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I don't have what I need. And she's like, I'm going to put together a packet, a folder, send you all the information. Um, you can't come in contact with the kids until you get all this stuff done, blah, 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 blah. So I get off the phone with her, and I sat up all night again. And I just started playing all these scenarios in my head. And I sent the text message at 7 o'clock the next morning. And I said, I do appreciate you reaching out. I appreciate the opportunity, but I'm going to decline. So I turned down the coaching gig. I didn't sign the contract. And I'm asking myself, did I do this out of fear? Did I let anxiety win? Or is this a situation where God was trying to tell me now isn't the time. Like, that's the battle that I've been having. Like, is there a reason why I showed interest twice for the same position? I showed interest twice. And something happened both times. The first time, I never heard anything back. The second time, I didn't hear anything back, and then come to find out the person who I've been talking and dealing with the most was going through some stuff, and things happened. But I just kept saying to myself, I was like, man, the, the communication is awful. This doesn't feel professional. Like, I, something about this was just off. And, you know, after very, you know, personal conversations between my wife and my brother, it was just like, man, you, you know how you get – you just trying to run away from it. You just trying to run away from it. You just looking for a reason not to take it. And then after a while it just it weighed on me. It weighed on me. And when I told her that I wasn't going to take it, it was just like all the pressure was off. Well, guess what? <laughs> Basketball season is here and I'm still living with those thoughts in terms of like did I really close a door that maybe God was trying to open? And I let my fear and my anxiety and things take control. And then I have an 11-year-old child that may possibly be getting ready to do the same thing. For the last two or three years, the day before tryouts, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go. And... You try to talk and speak and put good energy into them and tell them all these uplifting things. And you can tell that it just, it's not working. And like I told her, I was like, say your prayers at night, tonight. And we'll revisit it in the morning. And I'm saying all of that just to kind of put her at ease. But in reality, I'm like, I don't want her to, to not go to trials. Because I don't want her to live with that regret or constantly run away. Because the first time you quit on something, it makes it easier to quit again. And after this, I'm gone. Because I think it stems back to a decision that I made my junior year of high school.
due to personal reasons, things that I've discussed on this podcast before. Um, me and my coach had a disagreement about some things that was going on off the court and stuff like that. And that impacted my playing time. And I just said earlier, I always started. So the one time that I was asked to come off the bench, I really didn't know how to handle it. So, of course, I threw a temper tantrum, acted a big baby because I have a uh, bad attitude, anger issues, caused this big scene. And, you know, me, the coach, and my dad had a meeting after the game in the coach's office, clear up until, you know, late in the night, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I was left with the decision of, if you want to stay on this team, I'll see you at practice tomorrow. If you decide to quit this team, then that's up to you. And that night I quit. I let my emotions, I let my anger, I let all of that drive me to quitting. I had worked so hard, fell in love with this game, loved this game. And I allowed myself to walk away from it over a situation that had nothing to do with basketball. The next year, a new coach came in. The new coach came to me directly. He said, I know you're a hell of a basketball player. We would love to have you back. I don't care what happened last year. We need you out there. This is your senior year. We need you out there. He came to me personally. And again, I turned it down. I said, no, I don't want to do it. I've lived with that for so long. For so long. And now you fast forward and now it's like, boom. <laughs> Here's my kids. Going and dealing with the same exact things. And it's like, how can I give her advice when I didn't even take it? So I've been going through the blues for weeks now. And it ain't all necessarily, you know, sports related or whatever. Just life in general, man. Like, I just feel like life is kicking my ass right now. Um, this is nothing that I want to disclose or go too deep with in terms of being on a podcast and putting my, you know, personal life and things like that. But it's like ever since my mother passed, <laughs> um, family bonds, connections and things have, have been damaged, um, I know they say communication is a is a two way street, and I just feel like right now all lines of communication have been damaged, if not broken completely, and that plays a part in how I feel sometimes too, because it's like you just feel alone in this world, you just feel like all bad things keep happening, negativity, you know, just negative. Things just constantly consume your thoughts and you're just sitting here in this funk and I have no idea how to get out of it. I asked my wife a couple of weeks ago, I was just like, man, I, I got to find myself again. Like, I don't know what, what makes me happy. And it's like, now that I'm not coaching, I'm not interacting with kids and everything that has been another level of, Depression, I guess, is the only word I can use because I knew for the last four or five years I had a purpose. When I get off of work, I got to go coach. No matter how many times these kids may get on my nerves, I had a job to do. And I want every last one of them kids and their parents, if anybody ever comes across this episode or they're listening to it, to know that I gave everything that I had and try to pour 
every ounce of everything in me into your children. And it brought me joy. And now that I don't have that, I'm trying to figure out what's next. Because I I told you all earlier, I'm looking at it like, okay, I have all this time to focus on, on my kids and pouring into them. And it's like, okay, man, my daughter act like she don't even want to play for real. My son is still trying to figure it all out. He made the team. But I'm still trying to instill confidence and stuff in him. I'm like, bro, you're in the fifth grade, man. Be a leader. Quit being scared to shoot. I know you can shoot. And I'm not just saying that because they're my kids. It's like, bro, like, I've never been one to gaslight my children. So I'm I'm trying to pour into them and give them all this stuff that I wish somebody would have gave me because who knows, man, I, I may not have quit. Who knows? But I'm saying to y'all, and after this, man, I'm I'm gone, I'm done. It's like, bro, like, you try to keep a smile on your face and pretend like you're happy so people don't see you hurting. And it's like, bro, that, that only lasts for so long, man. That only lasts for so long, bro. And it's like, you constantly trying to be there for other people. And then you feel like ain't nobody there for you, bro. Like, that's that's the worst feeling in the world, to know that you wake up every day and you, you try to be positive, you try to be supportive, you try to do and help other people and uplift them and build them, and you just sitting around begging for somebody to return the favor. But you got too much pride or uh, I don't even know how to describe it in terms of foolish pride to where you don't come out and say how can somebody know to help you if you're not asking for help and that's why i said man shout out to the one or two people that that reached out and was like man you good i've been seeing some of the stuff you posted man you good and i'm like yeah man I'm, I'm cool man just a lot going on with life and that's why i'm asking and this is what i'm gonna I'm end it with because i'm like How do you know where God is trying to lead you versus you're running away from something out of fear? You've convinced yourself not to go through that door that God is trying to open for you. And it's like, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. I've picked up a lot of mental demons over the last few years. And this is my first time really saying it out loud. Like I sit around and I I think about the worst. And life is just, life has a funny way of trying to humble you. And I don't want to get to that point to where (laughs) I'm being humbled. When... In reality, I feel like I'm trying to do everything in my power to do what's right. But me leaning on my own understanding may be the reason why I'm going and feeling the way that I feel. So that's why I'm torn and I'm going to close and leave it alone. Um, My prayers are out to all of those that have been impacted by the previous hurricane and possibly the one that's coming. Um, you have to do what's in the best interest for you and your family. Like I was telling my wife, I was like, you know, some people may not have the resources to just up and pack and leave. That may be the reason why some people are forced to bunker down because you don't have the money to just get up and hit the highway. And even if you do, what if you don't have relatives and loved ones that you can go stay with you don't have money for hotels where are you gonna go so some people may be forced to stay where they are comfortable this is what they've put all their resources and poured everything that they have into their home so they're 
leaning on God and praying that it passes by. Like, how do you make that determination? Some people are like, oh, man, that's stupid. You had all the warnings. Why would you stay? Blah, blah, blah. I've seen things where people are like, I don't feel sorry for them. What about the first responders, the people that you're putting their lives in danger to have to come out and rescue them? And it's like, bro, like, it's so many mixed emotions, man. That's why I'm just like, bro, I can't even imagine it. I can't even imagine it. And that's why I'm just like, bro, like, right now, man, life, life is life in me is what they say, man. Life is life in me. And this is my first time really making myself this vulnerable. But it's like, you know, maybe this is the the step to me taking some of this pressure off. Because I just, I've been questioning everything, man. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm losing my identity. Like, I've been down here contemplating on selling all my shoes, getting rid of everything, and just trying to start over, just trying to start fresh, maybe re-identify myself. I mean, I'm going to be 40. So you're just sitting around looking at all this stuff, and it's like, man, this shit is stupid. I done bought all these shoes and spent all this money and stuff, and it's like, what is it for? It's like, I don't even go nowhere. I don't do nothing. I'm like, you just been questioning everything. I'm like, bro, what is going on? And the crazy thing is, and after this, I'm gone for real. Um, me and the kids sat down last week, and we watched Inside Out 2. I had never seen the first one, so I'm sitting there watching this movie, and I'm blown away by it. And I'm like, bro, for this to be a Disney movie, a children's movie, this is a message that hits home for all ages. To the point to where after the movie was over, I sat down and I talked with my kids and I was like, see, this is why you can't let anxiety win. Anxiety will take all the joy away from everything. And then it's no longer fun. And then fast forward and here comes my child and I'm like, you remember the movie that we just watched? You can't let anxiety win. You can't let anxiety steal your joy. Quit overthinking things. Just go to the tryout. Give your best. Live with the results. If you make it, congratulations. If you don't, congratulations. You you conquered your fear of not even wanting to go in the first place. But it's like, damn, man. Like, when did, when did we start having to have these conversations with 10, 11-year-olds, bro? Like, what is going on, man? And that's why I'm saying it's like, is this a result of people not being involved in church anymore? Is this a result of people steering away from Christ and understanding how all of that works? And now we've got a generation of people that just kind of lean on their own understanding and walking through life how they see fit and now your kids don't even know what to believe in or have faith in so now they're stuck with worrying overthinking anxiety can't sleep ain't no way no child at 11 years old should be fearful to the point to where she can't sleep she's staying up so that's what I'm leaving y'all with, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all let me know, man. Is is this a, a a deeper situation in terms of do we need to get back in our Bibles and building relationships and getting a better understanding of God and how all of this works and asking for the guidance, understanding that if I believe in in Jesus Christ, then I don't have nothing to worry about. Y'all let me know in the comment section, man. Um, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. Been sitting there betting and gambling. I'm like, man, that's probably part of the reason why I'm sitting there slumped and depressed now because it's like, bro, like you're, you're chasing money. And I ain't never used to be that way. 
I told you I hate conversations about money and stuff like that. And it's where now it's like, bro, I'm just I'm constantly gambling and gambling and gambling, losing, and it's like, shoot. <laughs> It might be a sign for me to step away from all of it, man, and, and get centered back and focus and trying to get back on track in life. But I'll save that for another day, man. I appreciate y'all rocking with me, man. Um, like I said, 705 subscribers. The goal is 1,000. Please uh, comment. Let me know your thoughts on the YouTube channel. If, you, if you're listening to this, man, go, go tap in on the comments, bro. Help me grow the channel. Let me know your thoughts. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Um, y'all go check out my therapist. Let me do this podcast. I saw where he, uh, my friend Mario, released a new episode today. I'll check it out tomorrow. Um, but until then, man, we out. Ass toasted. Yeah. No competition. Ooh. I'm Nisha Toasted.